the cowboys jabs. I just want you to know, here's, they persecuted Jesus too. <laughs> they persecuted Jesus too, so I'm in good company. All right, so Luke 10 is where we're going to be. Good to be with you. Joy is the topic this morning, and what's amazing about baptisms, the joy that exists in those lives of men and women who have chosen to identify themselves with Christ. What, what a blessing. Is that not awesome or what? Um, we, have, we have fallen prey to, to lesser joys, right? NFL, who's excited, right? A few of us are like, you know, whatever. But okay, maybe NFL is not your, your thing. How about this? I've got a word of joy for you. Announcement. A lot of state fairs have been canceled because of COVID, right? And some of you are really jonesing for some state fair food. Here's the good news. There's a company out of Texas that will send you a state fair food kit to your house. Do you want to know what's... No, seriously. Here's what's included in this package. You will get one pound funnel cake mix. You will get two pound turkey leg. You will get 1.5 dozen fried Oreos. You will get one pound fried okra and cream gravy. 1.5 pounds curly seasoned fries and five corn dogs. Give it up. Here, here's my promise to you. If you order that, I will come over there to your house and eat it with you. <laughs> you let me know. Joy has been restored, or, or has it? What causes you to get excited, right? There's some people that feel, I, I almost feel like the NFL is their life. And they're finally going, I can finally live because NFL started. I hope your joy is in something greater than that. Some of you heard about the fried Oreos. Your heart kind of skipped a beat a little bit, didn't it? I want you to consider, what do you get excited about? What do you put your joy in? Because the Bible puts a great emphasis on this word joy. We're going to talk about joy this morning. There's a great emphasis because God is a God of joy. How come when people generally think of God, they don't think of joy as the first thing? How come when people look at the church or think of Christians, they don't think of joy? Could be because we're walking around like this. Right? Here's what, here's what I believe. I think we think God is just continually mad at us. Like, how can God be a joyful God? He's totally ticked at me. Have you ever felt that? Like, he's constantly mad at me. Anyone felt like that? Or is it just me? Okay, hi, my name's Scott, and God's constantly mad at me. How about with all the fires raging in, in, in the West? I see people posting things like, this is what you get, California, for electing politicians. And I'm like, don't, if you're that type, put, take those posts down. I take that, this no, no, one, no one's give, made you like the Holy Spirit to determine like that's God's judgment. Fires happen. Can I get an amen? See, we don't think of God as a happy God, a joyful God. Here's what I do know. Bible is riddled with verses, and instead of me giving you a smattering of verses, I'm going to give you a verse. I want you to write it down. I'm going to show it to you. I want you to think about it later. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. Here's a, here, this is our God. He is the God who's in our midst, a, a mighty one who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness, joy. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. That sounds like my kind of God. We often think like anger is God's main attribute. We tend to think like judgment is God's main attribute. You need to know that there is a God behind it all who's a happy God. He's a joyful God, and he sent forth his son to reveal this to us. Jesus was a friend of sinners and tax collectors, which means people like to hang out with him. Do you like to hang out with angry people? Do you like to hang out with happy people? And Jesus was the supreme happiest person ever. So there's this topic of joy we need to talk about because we need to talk about what gets us excited. What is it that we rejoice in? What really stirs our hearts and makes our hearts explode with joy? Because what you delight in will show you where your treasure is. What you get excited about is going to show us what's the most important thing in your life. And so Luke, 7, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 24 is going to show us Four things that I want us to consider about this topic of joy. Because here's my prayer. Here's my goal. I want to tie your joy to eternal realities. Think about that. I want to connect your joy not to whether Cardinals win or lose today. Amen? I want to connect my joy to whether the Car Cowboys win or lose. I don't, wanna, I don't want that to be my source of joy. I want to connect our joy to things that go beyond relationships and sports teams and jobs. We need to tie our joy to eternal reality. So that's what we're going to do this morning. 
four things. Let's look at the passage. We'll go back and tease these four things out. Luke 10, verse 17. The 70 returned with joy. Now notice, every time the word joy or rejoice uh, happens in this section, this is the operative idea in this, in this section. The 70 who were sent out by Jesus to go tell people about, about the good news of, of, of God, they come back and they're joyful. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. It's almost like they're doing ministry in Arizona. Can I get an amen on that one right there? Right. And over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Verse 20 is such an important verse. We're going to get back to that. Verse 21. And at that time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and the intelligent, and you revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and the one the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turns to the disciples, and he says, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that there are many prophets and kings that wish to see the things you saw, but they didn't see, and they wished to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So take out your notes. Let's, let's, let's look at four things I think are very, very important here. The first is this. There's this temporal joy that comes from success, right? There's the temporal joy, temporal joy of success. I say temporal because sometimes we're not always successful, right? So sometimes we can put too much emphasis on results, and when results fail, we feel like failures. When, when results are good, we feel good. So we have to be careful because notice the 70 come back, verse 17, and they're excited. They're like, Jesus, we were casting out demons in your name. And it's not like Jesus rebukes them, and it's not like he squashes their joy. He says, I want to celebrate that with you. But then there's a shift. Don't get so excited about success, but get excited about the fact that your name is recorded in heaven. Verse 20. See, there's a couple things we need to understand here that are going to be important for us. I know too many men. Guys, we derive so much of our identity from our work. Women as well. And when our work's up, we're up. And when our work's down, everybody knows it. And there's got to be greater things you find your identity in. See, Jesus didn't want the disciples to think that it's always successful. Can I, tell, can I just ask anyone who's walked with Jesus, is it always just like perfect and always good? And all? There's sometimes I get frustrated. There's sometimes I don't do what I want to do and I do the things I don't want to do. Have you ever been there? And there's a sense of that so many times we are joyful based upon performance. Here's the good news. God loves you not based upon how you perform. He's loving you based upon who you are created in his image. Can you write, write down that word performance in your notes? And then draw a circle, then exit out. <laughs> because we do not live our lives in a God-honoring way where it's always based on our performance. Because that's what, the, your life will become a roller coaster. And, it, and your life, and you are designed for so much greater than that. See, there's two things we need to look at here in this passage. Number one, there's power in earthly defeat, meaning God has equipped us, God has given us the ability to overcome the enemy. The enemy never has the upper hand in a believer's life. See, this is why they said, you have given us power over demons. And I'll tell you what, every time a man or woman turns to Christ, Satan suffers a blow. Seven people were just baptized today, and those are seven examples of where Satan thought his plan was going to come to fulfillment, and it was ruined. Right? Because greater is he who's in us than he who is in the world, church. 
So what we need to remember is that there's power in earthly defeat. Here's what I love. I love being involved in the type of work that sees men and women bow their knees to Jesus. I love being involved in the kind of work where men and women see their marriages restored when they focus upon God. I love being a, in a work where we see men and women overcome addiction because God is working in their lives. I love being in a line of work where I see men and women overcome uh, the addiction to pornography or see the, the, the spirit of pride broken down. I love being involved in that kind of work, right? Because that's the power of God in us in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen from the church? And Satan suffers a blow every single time. And he will never have the upper hand in your life. You'll, he will never have, because why? The devil is not your devil. The devil is God's devil. And what you see here is Jesus, in verse 18, giving us a little behind-the-scenes preview of eternal defeat. See, what we see here at a surface level of seeing men and women come to know Jesus, there's a greater reality of spiritual conquering going on beyond our physical eyes. Notice what it says in verse 18. I saw Satan fall like lightning. This is Jesus saying to the disciples, I know more about your success than you guys realize. Because I have this behind-the-scenes picture of not only from the fall, Genesis 3, but to the final incarceration of Satan when he's cast into the lake of fire and everything in between. And here's the good news, God wins. And I saw Satan, when you guys were going out, doing your ministry and seeing men and women come to know Jesus, I was watching every blow. I was watching every defeat. And I was watching his plans come to constant ruin. Why? Because through the cross, there is an eternal defeat that is ultimately done. And Jesus wants you to understand he always wins. And lightning, what do you know about lightning? It's fast, it's, it's a flash of brilliance, and then it's quickly snuffed out. Guess what? That's the work of the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, don't give the devil too much credit. Don't give him too much. The same attributes that belong to God don't belong to Satan. He's not all-powerful, amen? He's not everywhere present, right? He's not all-knowing. He is a being that was created by God, and therefore he is God's devil, and he will ultimately de be defeated one day. That is awesome. So, so Jesus, he celebrates with the disciples, right, and saying uh, there's, there's temporal success, but what happens when you're not successful? What happens when things don't work out the way you, you want them to, right? I, I, I'm, I'm excited constantly about serving God, but there's, there's times when pride cre creeps into my heart, and God wants to he wants, to, he wants to go, Scott, don't, don't lean so much on your, on your success because success is fleeting. How many of you have ever experienced that success is fleeting? Or the fact that there's guilt or there's jealousy. Here's what I know happens too many times is this, is that guilt will rob us of joy. Success oftentimes robs us of joy because we're not thinking it of, in a context with, with, with God. And so here's what I want you to understand this morning, this question. What is the source of your joy? So like a good pastor and someone who loves you guys, guess who's making his appearance today? C.S. Lewis. So I've got a little book here, one of many books I have on my shelf from C.S. Lewis. You guys must think I have a love affair with C.S. Lewis, and you're right, I, I, I do, and my wife's good with that, okay? So um, <laughs> C.S. Lewis and me hang out all the time. There he is, Clive Staple Lewis. I oh, love him so much. So what I love about Lewis is this. This is, this is C.S. Lewis on joy. This is like the greatest hit. So they took a lot of his writings, and they said, what are some of the best excerpts? And, and so I sleep with this under my, my pillow at night, and I hear Clive whisper to me. Um, <laughs> that's weird, I know. So um, we'll, we'll move on. But So he wrote on joy because he grew up in England where, there, where there, there's, there's the Anglican church, which for him was lifeless, which was joyless, which was hopeless. And when God got a hold of his heart, one of his major um, agendas was to restore joy to people. Remind them, here's a quote by Lewis, it's not on the screen, this is bonus. Joy is the serious business of heaven. That's what Lewis said, and, and, I, and I totally agree with it. A couple quotes I want to I share with you. Uh, one right now, consider this. So what is the source of your joy? Here's some advice from Dr. Lewis, right? Joy itself, considered simply as an event in my own mind, turned out to be of no value at all. 
All the value lay in that of which joy was the desiring. And that object quite clearly was no state of my own mind or body at all. Some of you are going, what does that even mean? What it means is that there is a desire within every single one of us that you yourself could never fulfill. The desiring is for something, an object, that is beyond you. And so Lewis will argue that God is the object, the ultimate object of your desiring, and if it's not, all joy turns into pleasure, and pleasure ultimately will fail you. Does that, does that make sense? The object in which you derive joy from, if it's not God, is going to leave you empty and miserable. It's not your work. It's not your relationships. It's not your hobbies. It's not your football team. If it is not God, then your joy will be short-lived. Which brings us to our second point, and this is where Jesus turns our attention. It's this, the eternal joy of salvation. Here's the good news, that you are more than what you do. You are more than your successes and failures. You are more than your achievements and your accomplishments. You are of value simply because of who you are, not what you do. Can I get an amen from somebody? We grow up in performance-oriented households where mom or dad shows us love based upon how we do. And we need to return to a place where we understand God loves us not for what we do, but for who we are. This is the God who exalts over us with joy and singing. This is, the, this is the reality that Jesus says your primary joy can't come from success. It's got to come from identity. Write down that word in your notes, identity. Because you, who you are and how God thinks of you is going to fuel your joy. If we neglect hearing the Father's voice, if we neglect hearing him singing over us, if we neglect hearing him exalt over us with joy, we will be miserable creatures because nothing in this world will ever be a good substitute for his love for us, which, mind you, is unconditional, which is perfect. So there's the eternal joy of salvation. Notice what he says in verse 20, and I want you to highlight this verse, circle this verse in your Bibles. Don't rejoice in your success, Jesus says. He's not saying it's, it's bad, but he says, let me orient you to something greater. Rejoice in this, that your names are recorded in heaven. What is Jesus saying? He's saying true assurance, true certainty is not in you and your accomplishments. It's you and your acceptance by a God who loves you dearly. That your name is written in his book. And when he writes, you don't put your name in his book. He writes your name in his book, and when he writes your name, he doesn't use an implement that has an eraser on it. <laughs> you don't sneak in and write your name in there. And all of a sudden, God's like, Scott, Martin, how did Scott get in here? <laughs> he writes your name in his book, and he writes it in the blood of the lamb, his son. And Jesus wants us to understand that when he writes your name in his book, your joy is certain. It is secure. And no matter what suffering may come your way, which we need to be reminded of, or success, suffering or success, your joy is certain in Christ. Don't we doubt God's love when we suffer? And don't we forget God's love when we're successful? God says there's another way. We have our names written in heaven. And we need to fix our broken mentalities, which say this, that I don't want to find my ministry for Jesus more exhilarating to me than his ministry to me. Can I just tell you right now, what you do for Jesus is not imp as important as what he has done for you. Can you write down the phrase, the cross? Because joy is in the conquering. Joy is what Jesus did. Who, according to Hebrews chapter 12, 
endured the cross, despised the shame for the joy set before him died for you and me. And, he t- and, and what does he do? He conquers every enemy that's, that's levied against us. In Christ, he conquers sin. In Christ, he conquers death. In Christ, he conquers the enemy. And so for Jesus to conquer the very elements that are against me and thus frees me and liberates me and saves me and says, now you're my child, you're a citizen in heaven, I sit there and go, what? It's come at great cost and great love. This is why we have to talk about the cross, right? The fact that you have been loved with an awesome love. You know you've been loved with an awesome love. That your sins have been forgiven. Your burdens have been taken away. That guilt is no longer part of our lives. That condemnation is no part of our lives. Guilt stifles joy. Write that phrase down. Guilt stifles joy. Shame stifles joy. And because we take our eyes off what God thinks and we derive our satisfaction from the things we achieve and do, No wonder we're conflicted inside. You need to understand there's a God who's conquered everything, including your heart, to love you like you've never been loved before. Beware of loving God more for what he does through you than, than what he does for you. It's not so much what he does through you, it's what he has done for you. Lewis again, last time I promise. Maybe, I don't know. All joy reminds It is never a possession, always a desire for something longer ago or further away or still about to be. The centrality of the cross of Christ. Notice, past, present, future. The God who has saved you continues to work in you. And he will until the day you meet Christ Jesus face to face. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, right? Praise be to God that he who began a good work in you is not walking away to leave you up to yourselves. He's going to complete until the day of Christ Jesus. Can I get a hallelujah from somebody? See, this is the work of God. The fact that, that my name is written, recorded. That is really a term that says, my name is officially on the rolls of a, of, a, of, a, of a citizenship that contains full privileges that I have still yet to discover the depths of. You are co-heirs with Christ and recipients of all the blessings that are in Jesus. Romans chapter 8. What? So the conquering then leads to a second point. There's joy in the certainty. Here's what I love about the cross. The cross doesn't make salvation possible. The cross makes salvation certain. Jesus knows who he's going to die for. All that the Father's entrusted him, he's going to take care of. And here's the beauty of certainty. It it breeds assurance. I'm watching uh, the game Thursday night. Chiefs. We got Chiefs fans right here. Did anyone think they weren't going to win? You got a guy like Patrick Mahomes at the helm. Come on, you guys. So I'm watching the game, and according to Nielsen, there was probably 15 other people in the country watching it, so I was one of um, of those 15, (laughs) along with the Summers family. But um, So I'm watching the game, and there's a moment in the game where they talk about Mahomes from the perspective of his fellow players. And they said, give us one word that describes Patrick Holmes. So they threw up all these words, and there was like, inspirational. There is courageous. There was discipline, right? And you're sitting there going, that's awesome. And I'm thinking to myself, as a believer in Christ, what word would describe me? Like if I ask like God, God, will you put up some words to describe me? There's one word that comes to mind. You ready for the one word? So there's, there's your picture. Audrey, Marianne, Mike, Mike, Mike. Dave, Dave, Dave. There's a lot of Mikes and Daves. <laughs> Eve, Sean. If God was to describe you, what one word would he use? Here it is. You ready for this? Write it down. Secure. <laughs> Woo! I tell you what, as good as Mahomes is, they didn't talk about secure. 
You know why the players can't call Patrick Mahomes? Because he's imperfect. But there's a God who's perfect. And he loves you with this certain love. And he says to you that more than anything I want you to know is this. You are secure. How many of us need to hear that? Because we walk around life like treating our relationship with God like a daisy. You guys remember the daisies back in school when the girl liked you in junior high? She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. That is not the flower of a Christian. This is not the attitude who says, oh yeah, I love Jesus. I hope he loves me. I'm going to tell you right now. He loves you always. He loves you every day. He loves you when you're up. He loves you when you're down. He loves you and you need to know that that love for you is constant and it is perfect and it is eternal. So therefore, you ought to be secure. I'm not, God, did, did I do okay today? Was, was I okay? Did I do what was right? Did I love my wife? Did I love my kids? Did I, did I, God does not want you to be bogged down by guilt and shame and uncertainty. As sure as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, you can be sure of this. His love for you is secure, and it will never change. Therefore, you are secure. And all God's people said. So I have some friends that live in Oregon. And this last week their house burned down. And I just remember watching like the footage. They're, they're literally filming their house burning down. And then the next day they're taking pictures of just ashes. And you know what I love? This, this is a guy who, who doesn't know Jesus. He's like, my wife, my my little boy, we're secure, we're safe, we'll rebuild. And I'm like, dude, this guy doesn't have God. But the only reason I knew what had happened to their house was I got a text alert via Facebook that this friend had marked himself as safe. Have you guys ever got a message like this? Where there's people in like hurricane ravaged areas and they need all their friends to know, hey, just so you know, I'm okay. He marked himself as safe, so therefore, I knew they were okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been marked as saved in God's world. And no matter what may be going on around you, the world could be falling apart, and some of you are like, I know it is. There's one thing I know to be true of you in Christ. You're not falling apart. You're part of a different kingdom. You're a citizen of another, another world, and you can go ahead and mark yourself as saved. Have you ever told your friends that? I'm marked as saved. Oh, yeah, what does that mean? It means there's nothing in this world could that, that could ever destroy God's purposes for me. I'm destined for an eternal home with him forever. And it's not based upon my performance. It's based upon his commitment and faithfulness. You need some verses to back this up? I thought so. I'm looking at you. You guys need verses. Here you go. Get your hands ready, ready? Okay, exercises like this. Go ahead, get your hands. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 27, you need to understand, look at this, only those names who are written in the Lamb's book of life will be saved. It's a haunting thing to not have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Here's the key question. How do we know our names are written in the Lamb's book? One word, believe. Do you believe? If you believe, guess what happens? He works in you. And reminds you of the security you have in Jesus Christ. Woo! A couple other verses for you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. In him you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. Believed in him. Notice, pastor's not steering you wrong. Believed in him. We're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Sealed. Permanence. Security. Sealed. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance. When God guarantees something, guess what? He's going to fulfill his word. Guarantee, literally, that word is earnest deposit. How many of you have ever bought a house and put an earnest deposit on a home? This is a big chunk of cash that says, I'm serious, and I will come back and pay the rest. God does it with us through Jesus. He gives us the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder that he's going to fully consummate things one day. It's not fully consummated yet, but you have no reason to worry. He's going to come through. We acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Ooh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20, 21. 
Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The world is, the universe is Christ's footstool. And as sure as he is sovereign over everything in the universe, how much more is he sovereign over the affairs of your life that he is going to bring you home and transform your life? First John chapter 5. This is one of those key verses. Eternal security is so important to know. To you who need to be reminded of your assurance, you have eternal life if you have believed in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I write these things to you, John says, so that you who believe may know that you have eternal life. Here's the question. Do you believe? And if you do, here's the promise from Jesus himself. John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. Circle the word never. Christ is not a a loser shepherd. Where all of a sudden, like, man, where did Scott go? He'll never lose us. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. That is eternal security right there. Thank God your security is not based upon your performance. Amen. It's based upon his faithfulness to us. Woo! Where's your joy? Is it in the fact that you are known and loved by God and your name's recorded in heaven? I pray so. Number three, we'll go through these next points quickly. The ultimate joy of sovereignty. We are nothing without understanding the sovereignty of God. What do I mean by sovereignty of God? That he is in control of all things. Nothing is happening in our world that is without him knowing it, without him permitting it, without him allowing it. And as sure as he is in control of all things, he's in control of your eternal destiny. And Jesus does something. Look at verse 21. Jesus does something that is unique to to this verse. Nowhere else in the Gospels does it say Jesus rejoiced in anything than he does, does he does than he does right here. Look at verse 21. I rejoice he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, Father, here's what I, I'm joyful about. That you hid these things from the smart, the intelligent, the wise, and you revealed them to children. Why would Jesus be excited about that? Because here's what God does. He loves to hide himself from people who think through their wisdom and intellect they can, they can reach God. I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to brag a little bit. Because in my house, I'm known as KIA. Riley, what does KIA mean? Okay. I'm not calling. Where's my wife? Know it all. KIA. It's not the kind of car I drive. I drive a Toyota, not a Kia. But I'm a know-it-all. But you know what? My know-it-all comes with not knowing it all. Can I t- I'm the game show pastor. You guys know about this? I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire with Regis Philbin. I was on Family Feud with Richard Carn, Tool Time Guy. I've tried for Jeopardy twice. I have not walked away from any of those experiences as a millionaire. Why? Because my knowledge comes to an end. I was thinking when I got on with Regis, right, I, got, I did the fast finger. I got in the hot seat. I sparred with Regis a little bit. God rest of his soul. He was such a neat man. But I think the week before, someone picked him up and was twirling him around, and I went to go for him, and I think he was thinking of that previous contestant. So he was like, we started, you can watch the video sometime, (laughs) which is out there. Someone actually found the video of me on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and they were like in Tennessee, and they called me up one night. Hey, just saw your, your performance on Millionaire, and I'm like, should I be like excited, like someone recognized, or should I be weird that someone actually would seek me out? I got to $8,000, and then the mighty fell. Some of you are like, what was the question? I'm not going to tell you. I've gone through therapy to forget. (laughs) I wish I did. It's haunting me continuously. We had just planted our first church. I'm thinking to myself, we're going to build buildings, and we're going to do big things for God. Well, God said, $8,000, you're done, Morgan. (laughs) Free trip to New York and $1,000 in my pocket. I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And this is what God does. He takes the wisdom of the world and he turns it upside down and shows it to be foolishness. And he takes the things of the gospel, Jesus dying for people like us, 
and says that's wisdom. Scientists mock it because their pride, their intellect, their wisdom, they, they cannot think of even humbling themselves before something greater than themselves. I mean, if you think about it, here's God deliberately hides himself from those who think they're smart because he's not going to vie for, for you if you think you're all that in a bag of chips. Here's, here's who God shows himself to, the poor in spirit and the humble of heart. Those who realize that we, we can't go to a lab and, and try to figure out God. We can't take something tangible and tactile and, and look under a microscope and go, there it is. God must reveal himself, and he reveals himself in the most spectacular way, not to the wise and the smart, but to the ones who are childlike. Think about it. Take all your professors, all your teachers from science. Don't judge me just because I believe in science. All right? So you bring all the teachers together. And you know, they're all kind of nerdy, aren't they? Would, would, any science teachers here? I just want to make sure I'm not offend. Okay, I'll offend Anne a little bit. I love Anne. I, I'm, most scientists are not relational people. Right? They're like... Uh, we operate by atoms and molecules, right? So I can come into a room filled with scientists and I can stand in that room and not say a single thing. Those scientists at, an, at, 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 at a level of atoms and molecules can tell you about my makeup as a person, but they cannot tell you what I'm thinking and feeling inside. They can never tell you what my greatest joys are and what my greatest struggles are unless I revealed those things to them. See, God does the same thing. He has made himself known in this world where every man and woman is accountable, but he only reveals himself in a saving way to those who are going to be poor in spirit and humble in heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 20. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And he says there's the power of revelation. Ladies and gentlemen, another reason that should humble us is the only reason you know Jesus is because God chose to reveal Jesus to you. The only reason you know Jesus is that 1 Corinthians chapter 4, may I remind you of these powerful verses, verses 3 through 6, that the same God who said, let there be light, when he created the world, he also says, let there be light, and he removes the blinders from our hearts. And when God speaks, it is done. Who's grateful that God has revealed himself to you? See, there's power in revelation, but we also have to remember that there's the source of revelation. Without Jesus, who is the source, there's no life. Without Jesus, there's no joy. John 15, verse 11, bonus verse, it's not on the screen. He has come so that your joy may be full. He's the source of revelation. He's the God who's revealed himself to you and he has come to remove the blindness from your hearts that's the greatest problem in the world today you guys want to know what the greatest problem is spiritual blindness we think we're smart but we're not can, can i can we just be honest with each other we live in a we have made so many wonderful technological advances would you agree with that but how come we're worse people how come we're worse people because the answer is not in what we have created and how much we've progressed technologically. The problem is in the fact that we are spiritually blind without Jesus. And no wonder we can't get along. What's the answer? Jesus. Jesus Christ is the answer. And here's the good news for all of us. Can we just take a moment? When God reveals himself to us, he is no respecter of persons in the sense of it doesn't matter the family you came from. It doesn't matter the ways you failed in school or in your career. It doesn't matter how well, how well you've done in marriage or raising kids. 
when God loves you, he doesn't look for, hey, what level of education you have, you, have you completed? Uh, he, you know, when God loves us, he's not saying, how well do you understand the electoral college? Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> here's, what's God, here's what God is saying. I'm, I'm going to love you not based upon where you've come from or what's been done to you or what you've done to others or what your track record may look like. I'm going to love you unconditionally as you are where you are. <sighs> we need to hear this. Right, we need to hear this. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. God is going to reveal himself to those whom he chooses. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. All who believed in his name, he's going to give the right to become children of God. Those who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He's the one. That is incredible. Let's close with this. Not only is Jesus the, the power of revelation, or the, the power of revelation to change us, and he's the source of revelation, but the last part of joy, point number four, the expanding joy of seeing. Can I tell you how important this is? So, Jesus says, as he turns to the disciples. Don't you love these little moments of intimacy that Jesus like turns to the disciples like, hey guys, know this. Blessed are the eyes that have seen the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see the things you had seen, but they didn't see them. They wished to hear the things that you had heard and they didn't hear them. See, what he's talking about is that we live in an era where we have this full disclosure of God that some people prior to Jesus didn't have. You ever ask yourself the question, how were people in the Old Testament saved? How did they know? Two-thirds of your Bible, guys, hold up your Bible real quick, just, just check in. Two-thirds of your Bible is the Old Testament. Have you ever wondered, like, they didn't have Jesus? Jesus didn't come until, like, the Gospels, the New Testament. They did have the good news. They did have the message, but it required more faith for them because they didn't fully understand like we are able to fully understand now. Do you understand? This is called the beatitude of privilege. You have been privileged to get information that Moses, Abraham, David, Dan, you know those guys? They're the all, all stars of the Old Testament. They didn't have the full message of Christ like you and I have. So Jesus leans into us and goes, do you guys realize what you got? You got everything. There's no mystery. You've got it all. So now the key is for joy to take place in the hearts of those who believe. We have now this expanding, growing, vibrant, living relationship with the God of the universe through his word. And we have been given a gift that the Old Testament saints were never given. They looked forward in faith, and it required a lot of faith for them to look forward to understand what the coming Messiah, what Jesus meant, right? He's spoken of, but it's very cryptic. It's like shadows and type. But us, we get to look back at what has already been accomplished. And Jesus says, don't take that for granted. The beauty of a walk with God is this. Your relationship with him will expand. And the more it expands, the more there's joy. And the more there's joy, the more it grows. Do you guys understand the circle? When you continue to grow, you don't come to Jesus and then throw your life in cruise control. You come to Jesus and you hunger and thirst for righteousness. And all God's people said, what a gift. Your lives do not have to be joyless. Your lives are are not based upon whether your team makes it to the Super Bowl. And let's just be honest, no one's team here is going to make it. <laughs> your joy is not dependent on who goes into the White House. Your joy is not dependent on whether you get COVID or not. Your joy is not dependent if your marriage is just always rock solid or your children are always loving and, and respectful to you. Your lives are not based upon those things. Your lives are based upon the fact that it is, is your name written in heaven? And if it is, you ought to be doing jumping jacks. You ought to be doing somersaults. Some of you, don't, don't hurt yourselves. But be excited because the one who had every right to be angry with you and mad at you, chooses not to be he chooses to show you joy 
live in that joy. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. You, you have reminded me, and I, and I pray that you have reminded all of us that while we are yet so undeserving to be loved by you, you have delighted in loving us the way you have. And, and can I just describe the love as extravagant? Can I just describe the love as awesome? Can I just describe your love for us as, as exhilarating? Lord, it's amazing that you would choose to die for us than to live without us. That you would send your son that we might have that joy and that life like nothing this world could ever offer us. So my prayer is this, for those that might be here today who have not tasted and seen that the Lord is good, may their lives be changed now. May they believe in the one and only son that you have sent to die for them so that they may no longer live under guilt and shame and condemnation, but they may have life. And for those of us that are in Christ and we have forgotten the source of joy, return us to that place. The place where you, Father, are the only fountain that offers the true sustenance that our souls need. Forgive us for re relying on cheap substitutes. Return us to you. Be glorified in our lives and deepen the well of joy and the experience of joy that is ours in Christ. Because at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, allow us to never leave that place. Thank you for loving us, for being so awesome for this time together. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. It's good to be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Love you guys. Have a wonderful day, all right? See you soon.